it's, it's very difficult to build trust and it's very easy to lose it. And, and there are many ethical issues on AI that may lead to loss of, loss of trust. The repercussions of, um, of ethical issues can be very severe on a company. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they cover an entire range of things, starting from the relatively well-known, which is to introduce biases in the decisions that the organization takes, all the way to litigation, because nowadays, uh, you know, it's very difficult to control the inputs and the outputs you are using in your models, which may lead to copyright infringement, which may lead to litigation all the way to you know, taking decisions that are not acceptable to, uh, to your people, all the way to uh, leaking data, confidential and proprietary data that you have used to train your models or to um, fine tune your models. And all this results to a potential lack of trust of your customers. And trust for organizations is, is the ultimate good. You know, it's, it's very difficult to build trust and it's very easy to lose it. And, and there are many ethical issues on AI that may lead to loss of, loss of trust. Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because, you know, between the people who want to use AI uh, to harm and, and people who are using the AI for good, it's, it's kind of like the uh, continuous war between the, uh, the cannonball and the wall. You know, you build a, a bigger cannonball, then you build a, the other one builds a bigger, better wall, then the other one builds a new cannonball, and so on and so forth. It's true that if you have sound, responsible AI, which includes not only principles, but also includes policies, very concrete policies of, you know, how you classify uh, how you risk classify your use cases, how do you um, estimate the impact assessment, um, and so on and so forth. And if you have the tools to help you prevent all this, you make the life of the people who want to use AI uh, in a bad way uh, much more difficult. Nothing is impossible. It's very difficult to say that there is zero risk. But because nowadays there are so many organizations who use AI, the um, the people who want to use AI in a bad way, probably they will attack much more the ones who are not protected than the other ones. It's kind of the same principle as when you put an alarm in, in your house. Uh, alarms can be deactivated, but thieves prefer to go to houses that don't have an alarm than the ones that have an alarm. At least in many cases, there is a Pareto situation there for 80-20. Uh, in 80% of the cases, the biases are relatively simple and come in very few cases for a problem in the algorithm, but in most cases, a problem in the data, the data we have selected and that we have used to train the data because they are incomplete or they don't represent really the population or they, um, they have problems, they have errors, or they, um, they are focused on a specific group and so on and so forth. There are so many examples. There is a, one of the uh, relatively well-known was actually in the company got sued. It's a company that produces, I cannot, uh, I cannot name it, but it's a company that produces IVR, you know, automatic voice response systems. And they have trained this only in the U.S. They have trained this with many different U.S. accents, but most of them of white people. That means that if a Mexican, uh, a, a person from Mexican origin or a person from Indian origin was trying to connect to the IVR, the IVR could not, could not understand it. These are, these are the kind of biases that I call artificial stupidity. You know, I mean, it's obvious that you need to, to have a, a very decent uh, sample of your population on which to train your model. So that's the 80%, and I think 80%, many of them have been already solved, and, and the rest will be solved too. Uh, soon. And, and then you have the last 20%, and the problem there is that it's a second and third order effects. You know, the biases, they are not obvious biases, they are hidden biases, which you discover only after using the system for X number of months and so on and so forth. And sometimes you don't have, 
you don't have an answer because it becomes a societal problem. Very classical one. What happens with, let's say, banking loan pricing algorithms? The incidence of defaults in certain populations is much higher than in some other populations. Of course, the models find this right away. Uh, but, you know, imagine that you don't want to discriminate on race. So you take out the race, so you erase this. Then two things happen. The first one is that the models very rapidly, they find a second order. So, you know, very often in cities you have certain areas where there is a much higher proportion of a certain race living there. So very rapidly a neural network replaces the race by the postal code or, or the zip code. That's the first thing. The second thing is a much more deeper societal problem because when you diminish the power of an algorithm by taking characteristics out, features, what we call features out, of course you decrease discrimination of a specific group, but then you decrease also the well-being of the entire population because if, if I take again the example I mentioned, imagine that you take out a few features from a credit pricing model, the number of defaults increases, and that means that the entire population will need to pay higher rates to pay for the loss of discrimination. So is it good or is it bad? It's a societal problem. It's very difficult to, uh, to reply to this. But yes, bias can be taken out. There is a very fine line between good regulation, regulation that establishes a framework and some principles within which companies and, and need to work, and regulation that becomes so restrictive that it impacts innovation. And frankly, we see already this already because, you know, if you compare what happens in Europe, where there is a European-wide data protection regulation, GDPR, versus what happens to the US where there are some state-based um, regulations, data protection regulations, data privacy regulations, but not a federal one. And what happens to China, which, you know, it's supposed to have a regulation, but no, nobody really follows it. The level of innovation available in each of these large regions is totally different. So all this to say that Regulation is important, but actually a very large part of the responsibility for responsible AI, for better ethics in AI, lies with the organizations themselves. Because they are all in, in a different situation. You know, if you are deeply industrial B2B group, you have totally different and actually much less ethical issues than a, a customer facing B2C company. You know, so, so the, the, the measures and, and the actions you need to take are different and a lot of these responsibilities should not be given, in my opinion, to the, to the regulatory bodies but should be given back to the organizations and the companies. Very often, responsible AI and AI ethics have become the elephant in the room. You know, everybody has it in its mind and very few people speak about it because very few companies and organizations have cracked it. You know, they know that they need to do something about it, but they don't know exactly what. And actually, it's a very simple problem. You need first to, to make it visible for the, for the top management to take, take a, position and, a position and to say, uh, gentlemen, uh, th this is really a problem. We need to do something about it. And by the way, the person who will do about it is so-and-so, so to name um, um, a person responsible for, for ethics, AI ethics, uh, a senior leader, who will be then in place to, to develop an entire program based on what we mentioned, you know, principles, policies, tools, and so on and so forth. And then to integrate all this into the existing governance and risk management principles of the company. I know it sounds easy to said like this, unfortunately, it's a bit more complex when you're doing it, but I think it's an absolutely necessary step.